So, thanks again. And I now have the opportunity to uh, lightly step towards introducing our keynote speaker today, who is Fritz Roth, who many of you know. Fritz is a senior investigator and professor at the Donnelly Center, University of Toronto. He got his PhD from Harvard with George Church. And I thought about what I might do in terms of introducing Fritz. I, I thought there was many things I could talk about his science, but what I thought I might do was to talk about Fritz as a uh, member of this community, because I think that's what's really important um, as we go forward. So I spoke to a number of people and they said, Fritz's uh, real talent is as a community builder. He brings with him boundless energy and sort of a common sense uh, approach to getting things done. Um, I just didn't realize until I went to your website the other day just how many people you've trained have gone through your lab. There's a list of 50 uh, or so that have gone through your group. Many of them are now holding senior roles around the world, uh, contributing and really growing what is an amazing uh, scientific legacy. I think that tells us a lot about uh, you, Fritz, as a mentor. So uh, thanks so much for all that you do. So over to you, Fritz. We're very much looking forward to hearing your, your keynote lecture. Thank you. Just have to stop blushing. Um, thank you very much. That was very kind. Um, OK. Let's get started in 50 or less minutes. OK. Towards a contextual atlas of variant effects, I have some conflicts. They're not too bad, but you know, there they are. Um, I want to step probably too far back before I get into this, and that is uh, the genotype to phenotype problem. And it's sort of, you know, why haven't we figured that out yet? It seems simple. You just observe a lot of genotypes and phenotypes in a lot of people, and, and you just, like, look at the correlations, right? I mean, that kind of works for GWAS, uh, for genome-wide association studies. Uh, oh, OK. So we should probably stratify by environment, because that affects uh, how genes work and, and how they uh, yield, lead to phenotypes. Uh, so let's call that E. And uh-oh, we've got lots of environments. And in fact, we've got lots of genes. And the different variations uh, in uh, different genes can interact with one another. And so let's make that look easy by calling them vectors. Um, but actually, there's all sorts of interplay uh, within E and G. And of course, uh, there's interplay between E and G. Um, and how do we make that connection with all these uh, variables? And in fact, the combinations are far greater than the number of people on the planet. We don't have enough people on the planet to learn this by correlation. And probably not enough model organism, uh, organisms on the, on the planet to solve that. And so we have to think about the system of molecular and cellular machines that sits in the middle of all that, that actually mediates from genotype to phenotype. And so, you know, I hope we'll appreciate as the meeting goes along um, all the aspects of, of this problem. Um, uh, but anyway, so we'll simplify the machine with a nice little vector to make it look simple. And, uh, and I hope we'll appreciate as we go through the meeting that this is a hard problem. And let's not lose sight that these maps can not only help interpret variants in the clinic most immediately, but we also hope that they teach us about how proteins work, how, how regulation, gene regulation works, and understand the machine better along the way. Uh, OK, so I'm going to give a little bit of background on variant effect maps. Uh, I'm, my bias is on missense variant effect maps, but that's not to downsell the importance of non-coding variation. It's very important. I just don't work on it. Sorry. Um, and, but we'll hear more about um, from that from other people. Uh, and then I'll give three short stories on variant effect mapping projects. Um, I didn't notice until the intro that actually the first two stories were featured in the banner that sits behind the registration desk, which is kind of cool. Uh, and, and they're on a mug, even. So LDLRs, uh, these are in various stages of publication. Uh, MTHFR is published, HMBS is preprinted, and LDLR is, is uh, unpublished data, so uh, something new. And uh, the last bit of LDLR just came through yesterday, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then there's a section that's grayed out here, because I probably won't have time for it. But if we do, um, I'll talk about um, some computational variant effect prediction work that we've been doing, and um, more importantly, how to evaluate in an unbiased way these predictors. 
And then I'll close by returning back to the topic that, that Dave um, touched on briefly, the, this Atlas of Variant Effects uh, vision and the, and the alliance uh, for achieving it. OK, so many people have seen some version of this slide about how um, variants, uh, annotation of variants is growing over time. Um, but you'll notice uh, that this one doesn't look like the ones you've seen um, because I haven't zoomed out. Um, and so you see the annotations are going up over time. But if I zoom out, uh, you can see that these are all dwarfed by the dreaded variant of uncertain significance category. You've all seen a plot like this. And so that's one of the major motivations of all this. And thank you to Andrew Glazer, who's here, for providing this slide. Um, and so this is uh, you know, one important potential solution to this is to make a missense variant effect map. And so uh, you know, many of you have heard of this, but I'll just say you know, in some sense, you could say this um, stems from the idea of alanine scanning, where you take every um, position in a protein and replace the amino acid if it wasn't alanine already with alanine and see how that affects things. But this is everything scanning. And, uh, and so there are 20 amino acids on the y-axis and, and uh, you know, each amino acid position on the x-axis. And in this particular visualization, uh, blue is damaging, white is neutral, yellow is the wild type residue, and, and red is the rare case where the variant um, behaves better than wild type in this assay. And, uh, and I just want to give a shout out. I certainly didn't develop this um, field, so we'll give some uh, credit to Cunningham and Wells. But I got inspired by hearing Stan Fields talk about work from Doug Fowler and others. Uh, and I got really excited about this and then uh, learned more about it, got to meet uh, Leah and, and, and Doug and Jay Shanduri and, and others. And anyway, it's been really fun to be part of this community and watch it grow. And you know, we've done our little stamp on a corner of it. But you know, I think these are the pioneers. And I want to acknowledge we didn't you know, at all invent this business. And so one key idea. In, at least in the clinical angle uh, of, of looking at variant effect maps is this idea of reactive versus, and I'll come to proactive. But um, I hope the, the clinical geneticists will forgive me for being a little bit pejorative here about the reactive model of variant uh, classification and, and testing, where you wait until a patient turns up with a variant. And then uh, they have a phenotype that makes you suspect genetic disease. You sequence, usually a panel, maybe an exome, maybe a genome. Um, but then you get a variant, and you have to in, uh, try to classify it and then provide a, a, a test result. And you know, if you look at ClinVar, more than half of the missense variants are VUS. And uh, Sean Fayer, who's here, and, and, and Leah and others have shown, actually, I, I think there are folks from Ambry here, Tina and Rashid, have shown that if you uh, have a variant effect map, if you have a functional assay, you can actually, uh, in the cases they looked at, uh, reinterpret away from VUS about half of the variants. Of course, that varies from map to map. Uh, but you can get a, a more uh, informative clinical interpretation with functional assay data, but mostly we don't have that data. And so the idea, uh, th the reason why this is super important is, uh, and I, I, I think Brian Schertz might get credit for the original idea that every variant already exists in somebody alive today. I learned about this from Doug, uh, that on average, every variant uh, exists 40 times in someone alive today, every single nucleotide variant. And so that basically says we, we're going to have to uh, classify them all and interpret them all eventually. Um, but testing, I, I'm, I'm going to try to use the new language of classify, and then you only interpret when you see a patient. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll stumble sometimes. Um, but anyway, testing variants one at a time is inefficient. It's hard to interpret or classify um, different variants that were functionally assayed in different labs over, diff over years by different people. And so why don't we get organized? And so that's the proactive idea of just let's test everything ahead of time in an experiment in a well-controlled, uh, well-quality controlled uh, experiment. And, uh, and then we're ready. As soon as a patient comes in for the first time that we've ever seen it in the clinic, we're ready with some experimental data to make the uh, classification better. So um, this is um, sort of uh, my lab focused, uh, th this picture. But we've made a bunch of maps. This isn't all of them. And we've collaborated with others to make more maps. And so depending on you, how you count, we, we're at 15 to 18 <coughs> proteins for which we've made uh, a variant effect map. And here's a, a longer list. And I hope people will reach out. I'm happy to share the slides. 
I, I, I think they'll be shared online after the meeting. Um, but uh, this is a longer list of the projects we're working on. And so uh, if you want to propose one uh, to me that's not on there, uh, great. We'll talk about it. Or I'll say, oh, I think somebody else is probably working on that and, and point you there. Um, or if there's something on here that interests you, I'd love to collaborate. So I'm just going to say more about HMBS, MTHFR, uh, which does not stand for what you think it does, and uh, the LDL receptor. OK. So uh, three short stories, HMBS first. OK, so HMBS is in the heme biosynthesis pathway, and it's associated with acute intermittent porphyria. It uh, can be tricky to diagnose because it has sort of uh, various triggers and has uh, diverse symptoms, and, uh, and some of its effects can be ephemeral. So if somebody waits too long for the metabolic testing, uh, then you don't see uh, the, you, you don't detect it biochemically. The, the, I think in, in Europe, the, the, the definitive assay is biochemical, but um, genetics is uh, useful and, and increasingly being used, especially in North America, uh, for diagnosis of AIP. And uh, a key point here is that 70% of the clinical missense variants for HMBS are VUSs. And so we used a yeast-based um, assay. Um, and so actually, this is a really interesting not only gene but pathway in that every uh, enzyme in the heme biosynthesis pathway, the human version of the uh, human cDNA can rescue the loss of the corresponding yeast enzyme. So this is a very sort of, despite a billion years of evolution, a very well-conserved pathway. And you, so you can knock out the yeast gene, put in the uh, or make a temperature-sensitive mutation, put in the human version, uh, raised to the non-permissive temperature, and if your variant uh, is, uh, you know, allows HMBS to work, then uh, the yeast cell lives, and if it doesn't, uh, the yeast cell dies. So it's a pretty straightforward assay. And each one of these maps, I, it pains me to go from the assay and then just go to the map, because each of these is a painful story. And even though you'd think that this is turning into a factory operation, those, peop those of you who've done this know that you go through a lot of work, and then the data comes back, and it looks awful. <laughs> and then you do it again, and you change something, and you do it again, and you wonder what it could have been this time that killed it. And, uh, and so this is making a very long story short. And we actually set out with HMBS to make two uh, maps, one in the erythroid-specific uh, isoform and one in the ubiquitous isoform. And there is a, sort of an erythroid-specific uh, version of the disease. Um, but, uh, and we hoped to find interesting differences between the isoforms. But actually, within the limits of experimental measurement error, we don't think there really is anything that we found anyway that's different between these isoforms. So we averaged the maps. And there's our average map. And, uh, and so one thing we do um, pretty quickly is, is now try to get a, a truth set. And that, I, I use that word advisedly, truth set. We just take what we can from ClinVar. And if we don't have enough benign variants, we'll grab some from Nomad and hope they're really benign. And, uh, and I'll defend that by saying that if our truth sets are contaminated, that just means we'll be conservative in our estimate of predictive performance. Uh, so I, I think it's OK. But anyway, we, we worked with EPNET, uh, European Porphyria Network, uh, and um, grabbed some extra benign variants from Nomad. And, and it looks pretty good in terms of precision versus recall. We, at least we would think so. It, but it's not perfect. You don't get all the pathogenic variants. But you get about um, over 60% of them uh, at very high stringency. And so many of you may know this idea of odds path. I should have I cited my paper for this, but that's not fair. I should be citing the Brinich et al. paper, um, which came up with the odds path approach. Um, but I'll show some data that with, with our tweaks on, on density estimation, or show up a, a figure. Um, but the basic idea is to look at the density of scores from your map amongst uh, pathogenic variants and a density of scores amongst benign variants or proxy benign variants. And then uh, you can get a, a relative, uh, you know, basically a, a, rel a, a likelihood ratio of, uh, of uh, the uh, evidence that you saw um, if the variant was pathogenic relative to the evidence if it was benign. Uh, let's see, it's thinking about something. There we go. OK. So uh, there's a lot of ways to do this density estimation. But the, you know, the reality here 
is the dropped verticals are the annotated um, uh, in red pathogenic and in green benign variants. And then we try to fit some sort of density curve and there are dis different ways to do this. And uh, this is not uh, VSEP approved or anything. So this is just us and we'll have to wait for the clinicians to bless it uh, or not. Um, but what we've done is, is calculated in our hands these log likelihood ratios at each MAP score. And then we've used the Tavtigian et al. approach. And, and you can ask uh, Les B. Sicker here about how that works um, and he'll do a better job. Um, but there's basically a nice conversion between log likelihood ratios and the ACMG evidence strength categories. And so we've attempted to do that here. And we think we've provided uh, new evidence for 83% of the reported clinical missense variants for uh, HMBS. Um, and this is also preliminary data um, from collaborating with Invite, but they, they have been sponsored by Al Nilam, who has a therapy. Um, to do free genetic testing for patients. And so actually what was uh, increasingly rare in terms of variation in, the clin in ClinVar is actually picking up remarkably when the genetic test is free. And they're finding people uh, with the relevant phenotypes and, and variants. And, and so this, you know, they're getting 10 to new, new variants, novel variants per month. And most of them have been called VUS uh, over time. And so there were 114 missense variants in, in Invite's database. 78% uh, were VUS. 41% by their estimate were um, uh, potentially movable. I'm not sure the laser pointer has much juice in it. Um, 40, 41 were potentially movable, meaning given the most confident functional data, would the VUS leave the, would this leave the VUS um, designation? And so of the 41, uh, that were movable, we moved eight of them. And I don't know, is that good? Is that bad? It's something. Um, so it's 20% of the movable ones that, that got moved. Um, but it affected 22 patients, if that's confirmed. And I'm not going to tell you what the variants are until they've sort of blessed them and done recontact um, as needed. Um, but it's moving the needle. And I think um, I, I'm going to claim without evidence, but I pretty sure they're cons being conservative about this, and I think maybe more of them should move, but that's, that's you, you can understand my bias. Um, anyway, so we're making, it's already, um, there's a hint that it's going to be making a difference um, for patients soon, and so I want to finish that story and thank Warren van Logrenberg, who's really driven it, um, with help from Jochen Weila and, and uh, many others in the lab, and uh, oops, I actually have some acknowledgments on here from a different project that I won't mention, but we collaborate with Bob Desnick, who de who's an expert in porphyria, and various experts um, from Europe, uh, from the EPNET group. And I want to thank Invite and support for Al, Al Nilam, who uh, paid for the, um, much of the map, but not, not all of the mapping work. OK, so I'm going to jump to MTHFR. And, uh, and so MTHFR, no, it, it, yes, it really actually stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And that's in the one carbon metabolism pathway. And if you have a defect in MTHFR, uh, there's sort of a, a, a backup in this uh, pipeline, and you end up with an elevated homocysteine level. And um, this is interesting uh, in other respects from a sort of a context-dependent um, effect, because uh, dietary folate affects the abundance of the input uh, the reactant for MTHFR. It's even more interesting than that. So high folate can help some patients, but not others, with, uh, with MTHFR deficiency. And in part, that's because driving mass action, you just have more reactants, so you make more product, and that makes sense. But there's something even uh, you know, more curious about this, that it was observed that the cofactor FAD um, tends to drift off, tends to sort of be less well bound to the enzyme when folate levels are low. So there's, there's something a little bit more than mass action happening there. So I, I'm not going to go through the whole history uh, of this, but uh, I'll, I'll maybe sort of jump from what I've said already to um, uh, development of a yeast complementation assay in Warren Kruger and Jasper Rhine's uh, groups. Uh, Warren Kruger developed it and Jasper Ryan modified it so that you could control the intracellular folate level in yeast and that lets you tinker around with the folate dependence. Uh, and I'm going to use the terms folate, folinate, and folic acid independently because they are in interchanged quickly. Uh, and so the other thing we wanted to think about in, in addition to folate uh, 
is uh, there's this variant A222V, and I claim it's the variant most hated by clinical geneticists because I've been told that a lot, and I was at the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disease, and they should know, and I asked for a raise of hands, and it was really uh, quite, uh, quite biased in favor of this is the variant they hate the most. And that's not because it's that bad for you, actually. It's because when they see it on a naive carrier screening uh, panel, then they have to actually make an appointment with the patient and talk about them and tell them that basically it's not bad for them. Well, it's not totally not bad for them. It's 65%. It's a redu reduced activity. And there is a real risk of birth defects uh, in pregnant women who do not get an, uh, the, the normally recommended uh, levels of folate in their diet. And so, but if you sort of following doctor's orders and get the recommended levels of folate, this is not a risk, uh, I'm told. Um, so so you, could, you could say it's a real thing and worth talking to people about, for sure it is, um, but they just have to talk to a lot of people because 10% of people on the planet are homozygous for this. So that's why they hate it. Um, but it, is it so harmless? Well, clearly not here. You really want to get your folate if you're homozygous. Um, but we were interested also in what happens to a second variant that lands in that background. That's going to happen 30% uh, of the time because that's the minor allele frequency. So uh, again, turning to yeast, um, we, there's a MET13 ortholog, um, and it's a, uh, there's a deletion, and you can grow it under media where it um, is not, uh, this is not essential gene, and shift media to where it is essential, and then it's a growth assay. And so I didn't actually go through this scheme the first time, but I'll, I'll go through it this time. Um, the approach we use um, was TileSeq, and it starts with an oligo-directed mutagenesis, where there's one oligo for each codon, and it's an NNN degeneracy in the middle, so you basically make all possible codons, um, and you try to titrate the amount of these oligos, so you get an average of one hit per clone, and you move that into whatever your system is, in our case, yeast. Um, we like the gateway system, so you could take one library and move it, and, and you could potentially move it into a human integration vector or a yeast expression vector or wherever. And then there are two different approaches we've used. Um, I'll talk about TileSeq um, for this project, and the last one was TileSeq. Um, and uh, so the way you read out uh, the assay is you do this lab evolution of yeast cells, in, in the case of HMBS and, H and MTHFR, and uh, the sort of allele frequency, if you will, in this lab population of yeast, uh, it's changing depending on how functional the variant is. And the way you read that out is by, in TileSeq by sequencing uh, 2 million or so reads deep by Illumina in these uh, short, say, 130 nucleotide tiles. And the reason we have to go short in this is that we want to sequence both strands and get the base calling error down to one parts per million. And so we can call allele frequency very accurately down to parts per million. And then we look for shifts in allele frequency. Um, the BarSeq approach, I'll just give a, 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 you know, a look ahead to the LDLR project. This is where you have a flanking barcode and you use a long read sequencing method like PacBio to sequence the full length of the clone and the barcode. And then when you do the selection, you only sequence barcodes before and after the selection. And again, we didn't invent these, either of these ideas. And, uh, and actually, the Seattle folks have a lot more experience with BarSeq than we do, but we're finally getting it to work. Um, Anyway, you, you look at allele frequencies one way or another, and you derive fitness scores, and you get a map. And so, again, a very long story with a lot of pain, and, a, and it doesn't, I'm not going to represent it because I can't. But then at the end of the day, when it works, you get maps. And we got eight maps for MTHFR at four different folinate levels, and four different folinate levels again, but now every clone is carrying this A222V variant. And so at high level, you think, oh, you just made eight replicates. That's nice. Um, and it, you know, it's good to have eight replicates. But actually, if you dig in, there are some interesting differences um, that let us get at not only deleteriousness, but full innate responsiveness and, um, and uh, interaction with the A222V variant. And so I'll just I'll, I'll hit the A222V variant first. I'm not going to say actually a lot more. There's a bit more to say. But in this talk, I'm just going to say that we actually do see. Um, so this is in the wild type background. You can see that there, is, there are a small but appreciable number of variants that are sensitive to low folate levels. So that's one conclusion. 
Um, and the conclusion when you couple that with the A22V background is that actually, even though it doesn't seem to have much impact at all um, in keeping with the literature, at high folate levels, at low folate levels, in fact, the fraction of variants that have a profound sensitivity to low folate is going up. So there's this interplay between genetic context and environmental context that's complicated and I, I would uh, assert worth modeling, um, although we don't really, we, we haven't really shown that we can make full use of that in a human clinical setting. Um, but I'll just predict that it, we're going to find that that's going to, that will be important. Um, and I'll just go focus in the folate sensitivity side of things on one little position and sort of dig into the sort of how do we figure out something about the machine along the way. And so there's this disordered loop that didn't even appear in the crystal structure. And uh, because it's disordered, it's a tryptophan at the tip. And that tryptophan seems to be not at all important at high folate but really uh, quite important. Um, basically, if you're a non-aromatic substitution, uh, it's, it's quite bad at low folate. So what's going on there? Uh, so if you look at the, um, at the structure, I'll just first um, orient you by saying this is the active site cleft, and here's FAD sitting there. And if folate are, is around, or the actually the tetrahydrofolate um, uh, reactant is there, it sort of nestles in sitting next to the FAD, and it looks like there's a pi. Uh, bond there. Uh, and we worked with Rani Maya and Michael Garten, who simulated this um, with molecular dynamics. And they showed that when folate is gone, when the, when the substrate is gone, uh, then this loop flips into the active site and seems to kind of hug the cofactor. So this sort of fits this idea that the cofactor floats away at low folate levels. And if you substitute it with a non-aromatic, it's flying all over the place. And, uh, and uh, you know, you can sort of see that why that might not work. And in the, in the simulations, the FAD does float off more often. Um, we also did a precision recall curve analysis for this. And all the color lines are different ways of thinking about the experimental data. Um, but in this sort of earlier generation of computational predictors that we looked at, um, and if there's time, I'll get back to, to how good the computational predictors are getting. We don't often plot them on these plots anymore um, because they often win. It's kind of sad. But uh, here, against the older generation, the experimental map um, is, is winning. And so we're at, we can get up to, say, 70% um, recall at 100% at, uh, precision. An interesting thing is that overall, the map was um, pretty good and actually uh, <coughs> But um, the regulatory domain, it looked like we didn't catch many of the regulatory variants in this C-terminal regulatory domain that auto inhibits in a, in a way that's dependent on SAM to SH levels. Um, but when you calibrate the domain separately, uh, we were talking about this in an earlier meeting, uh, about whether you should recalibrate every domain separately. Well, in this case, it really did matter because we actually got back to uh, maybe 40% recall at 100% precision. Um, uh, from this uh, map uh, by averaging over all of our experimental maps, uh, but only if we calibrated separately for the regulatory domain. So that's something to think about. OK, so uh, lots of people to thank again, uh, but Jochen Weila and Song Sun uh, were the leads in this. And, and um, I was inspired to work on this by Jasper Rhine, uh, my former undergrad advisor. So that was kind of cool. And, and we worked with some real experts, um, Victor Kosich and Sean Froza. Um, in thinking about MTHFR, and, and we had molecular dynamics help and, and, and great support from multiple sources. So now I'm going to jump to the LDL receptor for the last of the three. Maybe, I guess they weren't that short stories. Um, all right, so many of you have heard of bad cholesterol. Um, and uh, so this is low density lipoprotein, <coughs> and the LDL receptor is a membrane protein that has this sort of tendril. The, the, their LA repeats that I'm going to come back to um, that bind the ligand LDL. And then when it gets uh, taken up into the cell, um, directs, basically takes the uh, LDL particle uh, to, to the lysosome for degradation. And, uh, and so it's, an imp it's important for clearing uh, LDL um, from the blood. And um, so uh, Atina, uh, who's here, developed uh, with help from Daniel uh, the, this uh, fluorescence-based assay uh, 
where the LDL particle is labeled with a pH sensitive uh, fluorescent dye and so it glows more brightly after it's taken up into the lysosome and so we can do fluorescence activated cell sorting and sort the populations of cells that each carry a different variant and sort out the functioning LDLR from the non-functioning LDLR. And in this case, we actually tried both the bar-seq approach and the tile-seq approach. And um, hey, that's pretty cool, right? Um, at least at high level, um, they look kind of like replicates. And on a, so on a good day, both methods work pretty well. And so um, we proceeded after that with bar-seq we occasionally regretting our choices because we had lots of trouble um, with uh, PAC bio on different days, but we've struggled through, um, and I'll show you the complete map in a second. Uh, but anyway, this, this caused us to keep going with BARSEQ. Um, we actually did not only the LDL uptake assay, but for the first two regions, uh, and now the fifth, which I won't show, but uh, we've now got a surface abundance where we've got a fluorescent antibody um, that labels the cells that got LDLR successfully to the surface. And this is interesting. You see differences. You see variants that are important for surface localization, um, but not particularly, um, you know, the, the, you can see that these variants, I should say, are important for LDL uptake, but aren't important for surface localization. So you can start to think about um, different subfunctions that these variants might have. But anyway, this seemed to be a more interesting map, and so we kept going with that approach. And here it is. It just basically, uh, the, the last, you know, talking about the, oh, I'm trying to go back up here. What's happening? It's thinking hard. That was a, it's, it's a big slide. Okay. Um, so the last fifth of this map, um, I can't tell you the pain that Atina and Daniel have uh, suffered from the last fifth of this map, um, but it just came through basically yesterday. And so I'm delighted to, for the first time, show the full um, variant effect map for the LDL receptor. And lots of things make sense in this map. I'll talk about some of them. Uh, I'm going to focus in on the uh, ligand binding domain. And so LA repeats 1 through 7, that's sort of the, in this tendril that wrap around the LDL particle. And, um, and so th that, that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to why it's not good, but, but I'll talk about what's good first. Um, so if you focus in on one of the LD, uh, LA repeats here, you can see that there are these absolutely critical cysteines that are known to be critical. In fact, in the uh, in variant uh, classification framework, you actually get extra points for, for um, any mutation in a cysteine uh, at one of these conserved positions in an LA repeat. And so these are known to be important for disulfide bridges. Uh, and so basically, this all makes sense with the literature and in terms of uh, known pathogenic variation, and that's good. So uh, what's going on here? Because we have these three out of the seven repeats that seem to be more or less neutral in our map, seems like they're not essential for LDL uptake, and yet there are pathogenic variants in those repeats, and some of them are quite convincing um, uh, pathogenic variants. And so we think that we're not picking up. Um, you know, somehow our assay is good for some um, parts of the protein, and, and we're missing stuff on the other. And we could say that's a failure of the assay and, and, and just note it and move on, and, and yes, we'll do that. Um, but it also sort of gives, gives you pause. Could we learn something about the machine in this? And I, and I don't know that we have, but I'll say a little bit more anyway. Um, so we think those repeats are important, and we just didn't find them to be so in our assay. Um, and so we had a hypothesis, you know, okay, maybe there's a sort of a stretched out version of this tendril that's important for embracing the larger uh, lipoprotein particles. So maybe they're really not so important for LDL, but they're more important for bringing in VLDL or some larger um, version of LDL. And so we predicted um, that, and, and this is a little bit um, unwieldy because we actually only had the labeled LDL. We didn't have the labeled VLDL to test it. So we thought, let's just be clever and see whether VLDL competitively inhibits LDL uptake. And the prediction is that there would be decreased VLDL competition um, because uh, in, the, in the deficient variants, you'd have decreased VLDL competition because they wouldn't take up VL, uh, bind and take up VLDL so well. And we'd then see we'd increased LDL uptake. OK. So uh, first, the wild type. We saw the expected result that VLDL is a competitive inhibitor for LDL uptake. That makes sense. Uh, and, uh, but now we found that actually 
in the, the def LA2 deficient LDLR, VLDL is better at competitively inhibiting LDL Frodo uptake. So now we're thinking, we don't know, we're, we're, we're looking into it, but basically the new hypothesis is that LA2 and maybe the other LA repeats confer selectivity that favors LDL over VLDL, that actually excludes, you know, selectively binds LDL but not VLDL. So it's the opposite of our first hypothesis. Um, at least that fits this data, and we'll find out, because we're now we're working on a variant, another variant effect map um, for just the, for the ligand binding domain um, now with a competitive inhibitor of VLDL. Okay, so lots of people to thank again, but especially Atina and Daniel who are here. Please talk to them about this, and also lots of um, uh, contributions from Jochen Weila uh, to this, and lots of other people to thank, including folks in Seattle who got us going with, uh, with PAC bio sequencing, the BarSeq approach, and, uh, and Callum McRae who, who believed in this at the beginning. Uh, and, and helped us find funding for it from the One Brave Idea Project and Rob Hagela, uh, who actually knows something about LDL receptor. Well, Atina and Daniel do, but um, okay. So the key messages from all of this are um, proactive functional testing is cool and possible, as many of you already know. Um, and uh, I think maybe less explored in, in this community so far, but I mean, not unexplored for sure, but, but I think what this work shows is that large-scale assays can help you model variants in context, and how genetic background and how environment can change a map, how we can evaluate that systematically. And, um, and the next part of my talk, which I'm probably not gonna have time to do much on, uh, so I'll just say something about it now. The computational variant of predictors are getting really good, and you know, we need, just like you, you, know, you wouldn't have had AlphaFold unless you had the crystal structures and all the people who made them. Uh, you also wouldn't have, uh, actually maybe that's not true for AlphaFold, but I, uh, for, for it, that's definitely true for AlphaFold, but for the new computational predictors, they're not so much based on the variant effect maps, but um, some of the recent work from Livesey and Marsh, and I don't know if they're here, um, have used variant effect maps to judge computational methods. And I think we, we have more confidence in them because that's a really unbiased way to judge them, and they're doing very well. And, uh, but they can't do this yet. And so I, I'm gonna put that out there as sort of a grand challenge to the community, is how do we do this experimentally? How do we thoughtfully explore the near infinite space of environmental and genetic context? And then how do the computationalists figure out how to make use of that information and learn how to do environmental and genetic context-dependent maps. So I'm gonna put that out there, sort of a grand challenge that we don't know how to solve. Um, and I'll just mention that there are a whole bunch of other projects uh, among those that I mentioned where we're thinking about how to model context in, in making these maps. So it's not just one map, one protein, one map. I think there's reason to dig deeper in each of these projects and they're, and they're, they're, they're basically all worth it. Um, okay. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this, all this wonderful stuff, um, and, and now I can say it's even better than it really is because you won't get to see any of the data. Uh, okay. I'll do the the take-home message is that our method rocks, as every computational <laughs> predictor author says. Uh, our, our, our variant effect prediction method um, it does very well and that in general variant effect predictors are getting better and, um, and we did a, un, un, what we think unbiased um, co uh, assessment of predictors uh, using UK Biobank data. Uh, thank you to the UK and the UK Biobank project for that um, and, and we have, uh, there's a preprint out um, talking about how to assess predictors with that data but uh, that's another day. Um, and I'll just close with uh, a little bit more on the topic that, uh, that Dave started us off with, uh, the Atlas of Variant Effects vision. And I'll point you to this um, lovely uh, marker paper, this sort of introduction to the article series in genome biology that, um, that Dave mentioned. And I, you can see I'm as deep a middle author on this as you can possibly be. So I had a small role in this, but I, I get to use the bully pulpit here. Uh, to tell you all about um, the Atlas of Variant Effects and give credit to the people who put this perspective piece together and the many, many people who've, who've put the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance together. And, and so I'm, I'm uh, being, uh, you know, at least uh, I'm in there somewhere in the author list so I get to show all the figures. 
even though I didn't make them. Um, but anyway, so the, the, the perspective does a really nice job of explaining how if we had an atlas of variant effects, so if we had a map like that for every gene, and not just for coding regions, but for non-coding regions, every functional element that you can think of in the human genome, if we had this atlas, um, uh, you know, it gives you a sense of all the, uh, the potential areas of impact of that, and, and this is, I think, a, a good subset. And uh, th it'll give you a sense of the richness of different assays that you can put um, proteins and other biological um, systems through and, uh, and give you a sense that the amount of data out there is growing. This community is producing, and I expect that, that we're going to take a sort of a, an exponential um, tick upward, if, uh, especially if Sanger has their way, um, and it seems like that's happening already. Uh, and, uh, and so the, you know, the vision is going from where we are with a few centers depositing uh, maps to many de uh, centers depositing, uh, well, sorry, I guess we want to, that, that wasn't my, the, the right representation. I want to go from a few maps to a lot of maps, and we'll do that through a balance of sort of factory-based approaches, um, sorry, factory-based approaches that deposit many maps and really focused uh, groups that uh, do sort of more narrowly targeted maps. Like, I don't think that you're going to hit um, all the genes with an LDL uptake um, assay, right? That wouldn't make any sense. So there's, there's always going to be room for the sort of um, bespoke investigation of certain proteins, and there will be a great reason to do generic assays uh, where they work. And, um, and so in the future vision for this is that we'll have um, many genes with experimentally determined maps in the very near term, and that in the hopefully not too distant future, we'll have every, at least every disease-associated gene, and, and Moaz was saying yesterday, uh, that 80% uh, of the, some, someone's estimated, I, I'll have to, you'll have to ask Moaz for the evidence that 80% uh, that of human genes will eventually be annotated as, as disease assist, <clears throat> as disease associated. So that's, you know, maybe we'd actually have to do uh, most of the human genome or its functional elements anyway uh, before we're satisfied with this atlas. And I'll just bring you back to this um, sort of backdrop and say, I really think we're going to have to go beyond that uh, and, and add to that picture and, uh, and make environmental and genetics context-dependent maps. And we can't do that to completion because the space of context is infinite. And so we're going to have to think thoughtfully about which maps we do. And we might want to do them not to saturation, but do them subsaturation so that we can train clever AI approaches to do transfer learning to take subsaturation data and fill in the complete maps. And so that's, that's sort of um, you know, a future challenge. But you know what, getting to that, that first map of all the human genome will, will be challenging enough to keep us busy for a little while, probably. So um, and now one more shout out uh, that Dave started for the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance, which is basically trying to do community building, uh, share protocols, um, uh, organize seminars uh, for education and, and explainer videos and uh, provide software, and I'll give a shout out for, um, um, actually, I don't see the category for design or analysis or visualization, but we, we made Mave Registry, which is so that we, this community can build each other up rather than competing with each other. And, uh, and so please, if you're working on a variant effect mapping project or you're interested in working with somebody else on a variant effect mapping project, check it out, because it's a place where you can tell this community and everybody else what you're working on so that we can get in contact with each other. So, um, you know, basically, um, Greg and I were both working on VHL. He published the first paper. That's okay. Our paper is going to be pretty interesting, too, with, with different assays, and it'll be fun to compare them. But we get to talk to each other about it ahead of time. Um, so please use MAVE Registry. Um, and uh, and this, this is really made um, possible by hard work from Alan Rubin and others on uh, sharing all this data in a sensible, accessible way so that we can, um, you know, and, and, there, and, and Alan and, and Doug and Leah and, and others are building uh, visual, sort of uh, viewers of this data um, from the clinical perspective. And I doubt, I, I'm, I doubt it, doubtless there will be a whole suite of viewers, you know, for protein science and for many other purposes as we go along. So uh, I'm going to stop there, but just uh, with just please join the Variant Effect Alliance. Um, Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance, and thank you.
Thank you very much, Fritz. And we've got uh, some time for questions now, and uh, maybe start in the room and then allow people online to, to pose questions as well. Um, so maybe I can get things started. So um, you've made 15, 18 maps, whatever the number is. What have you learned across those maps about the relationship between functional scores and phenotypic variation amongst patients? In terms of variable expressivity, are there some maps that are informative, others that aren't? Are so, there... so getting access to the clinical data in an organized way, as you probably know better than I do, is challenging. Mm -hmm. And so for CBS, we could show that the map correlated, this is histothionine beta synthesis, that the map correlated with age of onset and severity for MTHFR. The quantitative scores correlated with age of onset. We didn't have a severity measure that was organized. And hints, but, but and we couldn't find a correlation with severity or age of onset or number of attacks for AIP for HMBS uh, protein, but it's hard. And, we, I, you know, there are hints that the, the, the truth is that there will be correlation often, but it's hard to get the data in an, in an organized, standardized way that, that lets you do it. Mm. Um, and I guess the other relationship that's sort of interesting is it doesn't always, you know, the worst score isn't always the most pathogenic variant. So, of course, you know, many people know about dominant negative variants, but we looked at Calmodulin, and it seemed like there were sort of intermediate range scores that were actually worse than, than the null-like missense variants, and, and so that's interesting. I, anyway, lots to learn still. Mm. Thanks. Any lessons about how to get better clinical data is, is working with patient groups in one way? I think patient groups hasn't happened. I think, you know, for, for me at least, that, that hasn't been the path that I've, I've found useful. But, I, you know, I think we should be working with patient groups or patient groups should be working to get the clinical data organized. Mm -hmm. But um, where I've had the most success is finding a clinician who is passionate about collecting all of this data in an organized <laughs> way and, and working with them. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where we've had the most success. Great. I think there's a question over there. Yeah. We have a microphone over here. I have a question on uh, uh, the environmental factors I mean, that you are planning to consider for predicting the uh, pathogenic significance. So I would like to know if the molecular interaction data, I mean, the effect of the mutations, I mean, it leads to differential, act I mean, differential binding towards the protein-protein interaction data. How do you think this will improve or help in, in improvising prediction your pathogenic significance of mutations? Right, so, so I, I, maybe if, if I can try to uh, paraphrase a little bit. So, so it's maybe you're, you're saying, so why would I bother with all these subfunctional assays <laughs> to figure out you know, the effect of, of a mutation on a protein interaction if that's not going to help me in the clinical question? So I'm it, wondering like, if that data will really help you in predicting the significance. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's a, but it, it is a good question, but I think, you know, I, I think there's still room for fundamental research in this business, and it shouldn't all be about the clinical answer. And, uh, and I think if we try to look at these things, so if, if, if it had been the case, and it's not, that um, in LDLR, the only thing that mattered was surface expression and everything else was, was unnecessary, that was the only thing that mattered, then you know, we would have been using the wrong assay in LDLR, LDL uptake. Of course, LDL is the key purpose there, so that's not the truth. But, but it could have been the case that there's a particular subfunction that is exquisitely related to the disease, and, uh, and, and so that'll be true sometimes and not others. Uh, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. There's a question up there. Yeah, thank you, Fritz, very, very much for this uh, talk. So first, I would like to uh, congratulate that you, following up on our discussion from yesterday, you convinced me today that yeast screens are a useful tool. <laughs> um, okay. So thanks for that. Um, my question is, you enthusiastically talk about variant, computational variant predictors, which for activation, protein activity, I think I can follow. But for example, in the cancer arena, it's very important to also have an idea about um, drug response mm. um, and the effect that the mutation might have. Do you have a similar enthusiasm there? Do you see ways forward there 
how to predict this better than currently beyond just the activity of the protein, or is this something where we still need really mutational scanning? Yeah, I mean, I think in any context-dependent functional situation, we still need experiments. And, and so the, the, the enthusiasm I had was for the potential, you know, for the current success of computation in predicting non-context-dependent maps. And my enthusiasm for the potential, if you get all those smart people pointed in the direction of inferring context-dependent maps, maybe, but that's not, we can't do that now. And so my, my, that's, my enthusiasm is for the potential, but right now if you want to look at, you know, what are the mutations that cause drug resistance, un unless, you know, that's somehow just inactivating the function of a protein, in the general case, you know, you should do experiments. So, yeah. Question here. <clears throat> Um, so how are you comparing your conditions with, between your different maps? Like some of those, like the, the concentrations are clearly within an experiment, but when you're looking at different variants, they have to, by definition, be across different experiments. How are you doing that comparison? Between oh, oh the how do we get the maps on the same scale? The maps, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess... Um, I, I think I should just refer you to the MTHFR paper, and then if there are questions, I'll point you to Jochen, who's the guru on that. But you know, there's basically you know linear uh, models that uh, we do our best, and and we anchor to the mode of the nonsense and the synonymous distribution, so we at least get that right. But then there's of course a nonlinear potential for nonlinear scaling between zero and one, and. Uh, I think at this point we're kind of not doing that right, potentially, um, but uh, yeah, I think there's room for, for, for smart thinking on that. Yeah. The question down here. Hey, Fritz. Uh, I know a lot of the work that you've been, done has been focused on missense variants, but there are, of course, many other variant types that play important roles. Uh, and you know, my own personal interest is on intronic and UTR variants, and so I'm wondering, like, are people working on building those sorts of maps? How can we how can we start to collect that data? So, uh, great great question. I, I I don't work on them as much, but it's important for sure. Um, I guess our only foray into that has been for the LDL receptor. We actually have shown that a cDNA, well, it's, it, it's an imma, a partially mature cDNA um, can rescue with, you know, when we have shortened introns, because we can't handle the full length of the introns, but if we sort of hollow the, the middles out, we can make a construct where the introns splice out and the protein works, and we could do it in our way. But y you know what, you should also talk to, we'll hear from, from Greg and, and, um, and, and other people talking about um, saturation genome editing and uh, CRISPR prime editing, and that's in situ, and those approaches have been and are great if you're in the right context, cell context for that splicing event or UTR regulation or whatever, you're really changing in situ in the, in, the, in the gene. And so that's really the way to go if you want to see effects that depend on, on splicing. Um, we think we can model that sort of, we can do something potentially quicker with a immature cDNA rescue um, but, you know, as they get better and better, that's the right way to, in terms of being faster. And, and if, if, the, if we can turn that into a really e efficient approach, and I think they are, um, then that'll be the right way to go to look at splicing and UTR effects, is my guess. Great, thanks. Great. I had a question up here. Yeah. So this possibly relates to an earlier question put forward, um, but uh, for many, pathogenicity is a very broad category, and for many conditions you can get multiple different variants within the same gene that can lead to very different clinical phenotypes. Rasopathy is an example of that. So uh, how do you design experimental screens that look to predict narrow specific phenotypes rather than pathogenicity as a general? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, and, and we haven't tackled too many genes. We've done a little work on LMNA. It didn't, I think our assay was not the right one, but um, I would point you to Doug Fowler for that conversation, because that's a super interesting gene uh, with multiple diseases and, and different parts of the protein that are important for different diseases, and, and 
and uh, you know, it just hasn't been a focus for us, but it's a super interesting question. Thank you. And last question back there. Hi, fantastic talk. Um, and I love the fact you picked up on Jim Wells' original Alameda uh, scanning work, and I think kind of the more structural biologists getting involved in this field, the better. Um, really, one thing that interests me is when you now look at your maps together, what, what are you starting to learn about um, secondary modifications, so post translational modification of those proteins? What are we learning about those features from your, your maps? I'd say. Almost nothing. I mean, I, I think you, you, you'll, you, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll back up. So, I mean, if 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 they're functionally important and your assay is capturing the right context in which the post-translational modification is happening and important, those are a lot of ifs. Then you'll see it's functional, but you won't know that it's functional because it was post-translationally modified. And so that's where context, like that's a beautiful example of why you might want a context-dependent map. So if you know there's a kinase that, that is specific and important for regulating this protein, let's do a map plus and minus that kinase. And, and, or, you know, I, I'm not sure what the right experiment is, but, but uh, the, the only thing I'll say is, is um, Pedro Beltrao had an interesting paper where he took a lot of variant effect maps and tried to find what I would call sort of archetypes of the pattern of what is substitutable at a given position with the idea that, that, yes, there's an alphabet of 20 amino acids, but there's sort of a, a more nuanced alphabet of different kinds of tyrosines or different kinds of lysines. Uh, and, and so if it's a serine or a threonine that is phosphorylated, and that's what's important about that serine or threonine, the substitution pattern you see, we might be able to learn just based on what substitutes for it that it's important uh, as a phosphoserine or phosphothreonine. So I thought that was an interesting start to the question, but you had to do a lot of clustering to see those archetypes. And, I, and on an individual map at an individual position level, I'm not sure we're there yet in be, being able to say, ah, here's the map. That must be a phosphoserine. I, I, don't, I don't think it's so easy. Benedetta, can I just check? Any um, questions nope. online? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, encourage our online participants to, uh, to, to ask questions as well. We will get to them. So just leave to say, Fritz, thank you very much for a wonderful keynote speech. And Thanks for the invitation. Dave, yeah. oh, don't hurry oh. away. What, what? No, no, no. <laughs> no not nice the mug. try. This isn't the mug, is it? We, we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got a little something for you to, oh. to, to take home if you can get the lid off. Uh, it's a little bit fragile, so just be oh. careful. Ooh. <laughs> oh. There you go, you can put your, your wine in there. Ooh. Thanks so much. <laughs>